Hello, my name's Richard Felix and I'm going to take you on a tour of haunted Scotland. We're going to be visiting some of the most haunted sites in Scotland. We're going to St Andrews. We're going to visit quite a few haunted castles, haunted hotels and haunted inns. But what better place to start a video of Haunted Scotland than here, standing right by the battlefield at Culloden. This was the last time that the clans came out to fight the English. This was the last battle ever fought on British soil. To raise the clans in the past, right back to the time of the Druids, a fiery cross was lit and stood up on the top of mountains and hills to let the clans know that they were to rally to their chief, to come out and fight, especially to fight the English. Here on Culloden Moor, the clan system almost finished. After this battle, it was the start of the Highland Clearances. Bonnie Prince Charlie stood here on this site on the 16th of April 1745. He got approximately four and a half thousand Highland soldiers with him, Jacobites. On the other side over there, the Duke of Cumberland, Charles's cousin, waiting with at least 12,000 British soldiers. The battle was over almost before it started. The Highlanders were slaughtered by the British on this very spot and the embers of the fiery cross were extinguished here on this very battlefield. And of course there are many ghost stories. Most of the Highlanders still lay buried here on this battlefield as do the British soldiers that were also killed. And there are stories of people hearing the pipes playing, of drums beating, stories of Highland soldiers still wandering around the battlefield. Many of them were slaughtered even after they were wounded. The British cut the throats of some of them and bayoneted them. And anyone in the area around here, even as far as Inverness, that took no part whatsoever in the battle, were slaughtered. Men, women, and children. In fact, the bayonets on the end of the brown best muskets of the British were nicknamed baby stabbers. One story is of a Highland soldier that wanders around near the cairn that commemorates the dead. Sometimes he's actually seen lying as if asleep on top of the cairn. And for many years after the battle, on the anniversary, people in the area, people that lived around here, said that they actually saw a reenactment of that battle in the sky over here. They heard the drums beating, the pipes playing, and saw the banners of both sides fluttering in the breeze. And they even said that sometimes they could recognize some of the people that actually took part and died here on this very sad battlefield. So, settle back, give me your full attention, turn down the lights and let me take you on a tour of haunted Scotland. I've had a long, hard walk down this old trackway. I'm very close to Gala Shields, and I've been looking for a place called Buckham Tower. And guess what? I found it. It's taking some doing. I'm a bit tired, but uh, yes, this is the one. This is it. Now, this tower goes back to the 15th century and was actually given by King James V of Scotland 
to a man called Pringle, the Laird of Buckham. You can still see the original windows in it. And up here, which are on many Scottish towers similar, is a gun hole where the gun was pointed through there and could be traversed backwards and forwards, of course, covering the road, the trackway, which went right past here. But there is a very gruesome ghost story to do with this tower. So I think we should wander up and have a look inside. And uh, this part that I'm entering now is a later addition, possibly 18th century, and of course would have had a floor. You can see there's still a fireplace preserved up there. And look here, incredible beam here, over the fireplace down here. But it's this bit I'm interested in, the original tower. The Laird of Buckham was always on the side of the government, and he was famous for chasing and hunting covenanters. In fact, he used to chase them with his two bloodhounds. Often they'd be ripped to death. One day, Mr Pringle was approached by a local captain with some soldiers. They'd heard that there was going to be a small uprising and Pringle knew the exact spot where it would be. And he led the soldiers to where this unlawful gathering was taking place. Someone had tipped them at the wink and they were gone. All but two, two men, Geordie Elliot and his son William. Geordie had had a very bad fall from his horse and was lying on the ground. William asked the soldiers and Pringle if they'd help. Pringle wanted to dispatch them straight away, but the captain said no. He thought there'd be more use alive. He could give some information about where the Covenanters had gone. So the captain asked Pringle if he'd bring them back here for the night and lock them in his dungeon. This is exactly what happened. Pringle took them in through that very door there and locked them in the dungeon. He went back into his hall and started drinking. The more he drank, the more bad-tempered he became. And he could hear the screams and shouts coming from that dungeon. Old Man Elliot was in a bad way. Pringle came storming through here, passing some servants on the way who were going to help the old man. Pringle sent them away. He went in to this dungeon and the servants heard loud blood-curdling screams and yells coming from inside this very room. Then Pringle came out and went back to drinking. As he was going back, he bumped into Isabel, the wife of Geordie. She'd come to find her menfolk. Pringle grabbed hold of her and dragged her back here, took her into this room, and here, hanging from these two huge meat hooks, were the dead bodies of her menfolk, looking more like carcasses of meat than human beings. She turned to him and cursed him. And after that curse was put on him, he said he was a haunted man. He used to have dreadful dreams of being haunted by hounds, chased by hounds. And he only lasted a couple of years before he died. And they say that even on his deathbed, he heard the baying of the hounds chasing him. And they say that on the anniversary of his death, round about the 28th of June, people still see the ghost of the Laird of Buckham wandering around this place. They also hear the screams of Geordie Elliot and his son William. I've just come up here, had a problem finding the place, knocked on the door of the little crofter's cottage which is next door. Spoke to the gentleman and he said, yes, this is the place. And I said, is it true? Is it haunted? 
Oh, he said, yes. He said, uh, I often hear noises. When I'm out with the dogs at night, I often see shadows just out the corner of my eye. Turn and look. And of course, there's no one there. But he said, it's very active in late June, which of course is the anniversary of the deaths. And he said, sometimes you can lie in bed at night and you can hear crashing and banging. Sounds as if the whole tower is falling down. But then you come out the next morning and of course he says, everything's still in place, just as it was the night before. And it's not every day that you actually find a pub that openly advertises the fact that it's got a ghost to such an extent that it's mentioned on a plaque on the wall. This is in fact the second oldest coaching inn in Scotland and according to the plaque believed to be the oldest inn in Peebles. But it also states on the plaque the Cross Keys was a favourite haunt of no less than Sir Walter Scott and is featured in several of his novels. The original landlady, Marion Ritchie, was the prototype of Meg Dodds from the Waverley novels and still is believed to benevolently haunt the inn to this day. Why does she haunt this pub? Possibly because she was such a character that she still lingers to this day. Perhaps she believes that no one can do the job like she did. She's not been seen on many occasions. She's more of a poltergeist. She moves things, things blow up, glasses move. But she very much uses her powers through electricity. Televisions switching themselves on and off, lights coming on, telephones. The landlady's told me that one of her friends actually saw the ghost standing behind the landlady, obviously watching her, making sure that she was in fact doing her job as well as Marion used to do it. But there's a very haunted bedroom. They tell me that lots of people actually come here and ask if they can have the haunted bedroom for the night. So I think it would be a good idea if we went inside, see if they'll let us have a look at the very room, room number five. So come with me. And they've actually given me the key. The key to room number five. This is the haunted bedroom. This is the actual bedroom of Marion Ritchie. Staff say that when they're in here making beds, cleaning up, they're never alone. Customers on many occasions say they know for a fact that they left this window closed. But when they come back, someone's opened it. The television on many occasions has a mind of its own. It switches itself on, it switches itself off. Lights come on and off of their own accord. And they say that it's the ghostly hands of Marion Ritchie. But why does she still haunt this building? Some say she was such a keen landlady that she left her mark on the building. She still haunts it because she loved it so much. But others tell me that she's still lingering still waiting for her long lost lover, a fisherman who was drowned at sea and never returned. And she is still lingering, still waiting for the day when he returns to this place. This is New Castleton and behind me the well-preserved castle called Hermitage Castle with ghosts of course. This was at one time the home of Sir William Douglas and in 1342 Sir Alexander Ramsay, Sheriff of Tevitdale, came here to meet his supposed friend Sir William but for some reason Sir William had him captured and thrown into the dungeons where they left him to rot. Many hundreds of years later in the late 19th century a mason 
was doing some repair work here and he exposed an old door to a dungeon that no one knew about. In that dungeon was a skeleton and a rusty sword believed to be that of no less than Sir Alexander Ramsay. And they say that on a dark windy night, always a full moon, that many people living in this area and custodians alike still hear screams and cries and blood-curdling yells coming from the dungeons. This was also, for a period of time, the home of James Bothwell, Earl of Hepburn. He, of course, married no less than Mary, Queen of Scots. They say that he had a hand in the murder of her second husband, Darnley. And there has been seen a ghost here wearing a long white dress and a white veil. And they say that it is the ghost of no less than Mary, Queen of Scots, who, of course, visited her lover here on a few occasions. But the strange thing about it is that, of course, Mary didn't die here. So why should she haunt this place? I think it may be something to do with the fact that this woman, Mary, one of the most famous women in the world, had such energy, such a presence, such an aura, that she left a part of herself. Just as when you meet certain people and they say, they left a lasting impression on me. I believe that Mary Stuart also left a lasting impression here at Hermitage Castle. Stirling Castle, perched high on a volcanic hill, has always dominated the north-south, east-west routes through Scotland and has played a major part in the struggle between Scotland and England. Many famous Scots have been involved with this castle. William Wallace, Robert the Bruce, Bonnie Prince Charlie. It was here at this castle at Stirling that King James II stabbed the Earl of Douglas to death and threw his body 250 feet over the ramparts onto the rocks below. They say that the ghost of the Earl of Douglas still haunts the rocks at the bottom. But there are two major ghosts here. One, a green lady that haunts the castle, is a harbinger of ill luck, of bad luck. This place, even to this day, is still a military garrison and many soldiers have reported seeing the Green Lady. A cook actually cooking a meal for the officers' mess, and the meal was late because of it, was alone in the kitchen. He sensed a presence. He realised he wasn't alone, turned and saw this green hazy mist standing by the cooker. He fainted, and as I say, the officer's meal was late. Many sentries have reported seeing the ghost of the Green Lady, and one sentry, late at night, going to relieve another, came up to him. He was motionless, slumped over the battlements, his rifle lying on the floor. The soldier was stone dead, his mouth open and his eyes staring in disbelief, as if he'd seen some awful figure that obviously frightened him to death. It's also believed that the Green Lady could be one of Mary Queen of Scots servants. She had four servants, all strangely enough by the name of Mary. Mary Queen of Scots spent quite a lot of her childhood days here at Stirling Castle. And on one occasion, this Green Lady, this Mary, saved Mary Queen of Scots from burning to death. She smelt smoke went into the Queen's bedchamber and found that all of the drapes and hangings on the four-poster bed were blazing and the Queen was inside. She, of course, saved her life 
and Mary actually said later that on one or two occasions she had dreamt nights before that she was going to burn to death here at Stirling Castle. There's also a pink lady that wanders around the castle, along the battlements, down through this graveyard and over to the church perched on the rocks just over there. It's believed that this is the area where the ladies used to watch the knights jousting and on one of the occasions when King Edward I of England besieged the castle most of the occupants of the castle were killed and it is said that the only one that lived was the pink lady and they say that she returns to the castle or wandering around the graveyard looking for her betrothed who of course will never return. And um, I'm in St Andrews, probably one of the most famous views in the world behind us here, but uh, we're not here for golf, we're here for ghosts, and with me is Shirley Young. Um, Shirley, you do the ghost walk round St Andrews, and of course you're, you're dressed as a rather famous witch of St Andrews, and there's a reason of course that we're standing here, not just for the golf course, but it's the hill, isn't it? Yes, this is a fairy hill, or the witch's hill, where witches were burned at the stake in, during the Reformation. Actually on this, on Actually this, on this where hill. we're standing now. Mm -hmm. Now you had quite a few, you were quite notorious at burning witches, weren't you? There are reputed to be about 50 burned in St Andrews, 4,000 in Scotland altogether, just mm. under 4,000. But you got through about 50? We got through about here. 50. On this spot? On this spot. So if anywhere should be haunted? This it certainly should be. Yeah. Are there any... Um, Go, goings on around here? Or? There are shadow figures said to be seen here and there um, along the town. Yeah, um, yeah. Whether, it, whether it's due to drink or whether it's due to real ghosts. Mm, you mean it could be the spirits behind the bar? Uh, you never know. You <laughs> never know. But I've heard people say they've seen ghosts and I've no reason to disbelieve them. No, no, I'm sure. But you actually take ghost walks round, round St Andrews throughout the year, in yes, fact. Yes, I do, every Friday night. And you, you, you've got quite a lot of ghost stories of course within the I mean we're talking of a very very old town are we not? We are indeed it goes way back um, the, t the university in the town was the first university in Scotland and it was founded in 1410 right yeah um, and they celebrated apparently with three days riotous celebration in the streets when the, the people blew it out in February 1411 good lord and here of course we're standing as I said, you said on, on Witcher's Hill, mm -hmm. Fairy Hill, there's also a monument um, in front of us to, to five Protestants that were also burnt in St Andrews. That's true. So you really do have quite a lot of um, <laughs> death and torment yes. and terror that must have gone on. Obviously, that, that's why it's such a haunted place. Mm -hmm. But you've, you've got a special spot, of course, where we're, you're going to take me to now, because we obviously have not not going to do the whole of your ghost walk, but there's a good place, I believe, up the road, the cathedral. Uh-huh. So... Well, hopefully we'll see our spirit, you never know. Do you think so? You never know. Would you like to lead on? Certainly. Okay. Now, surely, we've stopped for a very good reason. There's some initials here in the stonework. Someone die here? Patrick Hamilton in 1528. He was burned on this very spot. Wow, and he had a rather nasty death, I believe. He did. They weren't used to executing people by burning at that time, and the executioners used green wood for the pyre. So basically, he choked to death in the smoke before he was burned to death. And it took him six hours? It took him six hours. Oh, morning, my gosh. Until six in the evening. So he would have had a rather tortured soul, to say the least, yeah? I think so. My goodness me. And what about the stonework up here? I mean, there's something rather special. Yes, in the stone. Look, six stones from Bishop Kennedy's coat of arms, six stones up. Yes, yes, there's a face. This is face. That's Patrick Hamilton's face. Patrick Hamilton's face is said to have imprinted there when his soul collided with the tower and it's used to reach out. Oh my God. Now the thing is, I'm, I'm, I'm a great believer in um, an idea known as the stone tapes, where they believe that stone has certain properties very similar to recording tapes and that they believe that after a tragic and traumatic death, the stone can actually hold a recording 
made just before the death took place. But this adds to it in, in a way I've never seen before because we're actually talking of an imprint, a recording made in that stonework, almost, if you like, an early photograph of Patrick Hamilton just as his soul was leaving his body. That's what you see. That is amazing. I've never seen anything like it anywhere in this country. Shall we carry on to the cathedral? And here we are outside the walls of St Andrew's Cathedral. That's right. Now mainly derelict, of course. It's still the longest extant uh, example of medieval walling in Scotland. This is? This is. It covers, it contains 22 acres. Right. That's 13 remaining towers. And this, to me, looks like a spooky old tower. This is, this is a square tower, um, and it's supposed to be haunted by the ghost of the White Lady. Right. This is actually the fishermen's area of the town, between here at the harbours just down there. And fishermen and their families wouldn't walk past here, they would run past here as it got dark. Because several people had seen a lady dressed all in white walking along the ramparts back and forward. Right, yes. Eventually curiosity got the better of people and in the early 1800s they broke into the top part of the tower. Yes. And inside that room they found coffins and in the coffins they found the perfectly preserved bodies of men except for one in the corner which contained the perfectly preserved body of a woman dressed all in white, white gloves on her hands, long dark hair. So they sealed the tomb up again and went away and 20 years later Dean of Guild W.T. Linskill who collected ghost stories broke into that tower again but this time all the coffins were broken, there was a jumble of bones, no beautiful white lady. Good Lord. It remains unsolved to this day. I say. But they do say since then that if you put your hand through the wall here, yes. you may well shake hands with a ghost. But if you do, you'll die within the year. Do you want to try it? <laughs> Shall I try as well? No, there's nothing there. Shirley, that, that's, that's fantastic. Now, tell me, you do these ghost walks throughout the year around St Andrews. Um, how do people, if they want to come on one of these incredible walks, how do they, how do, they do it? They just phone me. Right. And the con and I'll turn out. Fantastic. Shirley, it's been a pleasure meeting you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just outside St Andrews on the main road at the inn at Lathones. Very old inn, parts of it going back to the 1600s. And it's got lots of ghosts. It's got a grey lady, the ghost of a horse in the stables. A poltergeist, an active one. And also the ghost of a highwayman. A midget highwayman called Mad Wee McGregor. So I think the best thing to find out is to Go inside, have a word with the landlord, and see if we can find any of his ghosts. Right, well, we're inside the inn. Um, with me, Nick, the, the proprietor of the hotel. Yeah, that's right, Richard. Th this is the oldest part, is it not? That is. It, it goes back to 1603. Yeah, you can tell as well. Yeah, it's lovely. And you have experienced something. Excellent. I have, I have, but not. I didn't even believe in ghosts before we bought this place. Nah. And that was seven years ago, and we've had some very interesting things happen. What, what sort of, I mean, to you personally, or...? Well, only one. In fact, that, that was the turning point for me, because uh, I was in here doing a whiskey tasting for a group, and uh, they were all sort of seated round, and we were just about to start the whiskey tasting. They were taking the mickey out of me and my ghost. Right, and, uh, as all people sudden, do. The tools here and a few old this. others yep, just picked up and moved across the fireplace and sat down over here. Just like that. So, right in front of everybody. Everybody saw it? Everybody. Incl and I presume you've got your back to it? I had my back to it. I turned round and it was in midway over at that point and uh, you've never seen 30 chaps go so quiet in your life. <laughs> so it, it, it didn't, it wasn't thrown across? No, not at all. It, it just it came was across slowly and gently and, and just sat itself down. Sat it didn't crash to the ground. 
No yeah. drafts in here? No, come no, off it. None. I mean, all I can tell you is whoever did it has a very serious sense of humour. And it wasn't wired no or anything was. ridiculous. Nothing. And there they was also. No, way of doing no, of course not. I can say it was heavy. As I, as I say, I mean, I, I was not a believer before I saw this happen. But it changes your outlook, it doesn't it? It does slightly. Yeah, absolutely. Now, tell me, the, there's all sorts of ghosts. I mean, it, it's yeah. not, obviously that's poltergeist activity. Yeah, that's right. But you have other things, don't you? There's we supposedly do. a grey lady? We, we have a grey lady. We've never seen the grey lady, but uh, the grey lady is the, the oldest ghost story in the, in the inn. Yeah. And she's supposed to actually bring her horse through uh, into the stables and actually put the horse to bed and then leave the stables through the old door, which is just here. But uh, we've never seen that happen. No. But somebody has experienced a grey mist. Definitely. That was in one of the new bedrooms as well. Oh, really? Uh, it was a member of the RNA. He uh, came in one night to start the golf tournament, which happens every year. Yeah. He hadn't had anything to drink at all because he takes his golf very seriously. And he spent the night sitting in his armchair watching a mist swell over his head. Really? Yeah. yeah. And that's not the spirits behind he the bar. Was a, he was a fairly pale looking guy in the morning. Though. I can imagine. But uh, we, we've never had anything that's really sort of upset anybody. No, you don't. Yeah. Actually, most ghost stories are not are not frightening ghost stories. But what about your highwayman? This uh, mad McGregor. Uh, wee McGregor, supposedly. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, he, he was a real person. Uh, we, we had a, an ex-professor from uh, university help us uh, do the history of the inn. And McGregor was a highwayman in this area at about... Uh, um, 1600, 1603. Yes. And uh, he was noted to use the local inn. Well, we're the only inn in this area, so we've assumed that it was us that he used. Mm. And I presume he worked the highway, the, the road up and this, down this here. This was the original road that, that people came in and out of into St Andrews, and they would use this as the stop off before they take the animals down to the market. Yeah. So he'd cash them either on the way in or on the way back out. Rob them, take the money, or whatever, and then... So he is a real person? Real person, absolutely. And reputedly, again, haunts yes. the area around here, the road. That's right. And possible, because again, it was stables here, yeah. every possibility that in here yeah. as well. So you've actually got a, um, a plethora we have. of ghosts we have. We have. In, in, in the building. Yeah. And um, I presume, like most places now, you actually do get people that, that know about it and want to come and stay Absolutely. in a haunted more, hotel. More and more people are in, get, getting into this now. Yeah, and we have a, a, a lot of people coming from all over the world, in fact, who yeah. pick us. And we, On your we website, of course. Off our website, and in fact, we run a, a ghost tour th out of Germany with, with a German tour operator, really? where they stay in haunted uh, hotels all over, all, well, all over Europe. Yeah. But predominantly up in Scotland, we have one. And they make for you, of course. Absolutely. Nick, that's been fantastic. Great. Thank you very much no for problem. letting us into your property. It's Thank been you. A great pleasure to have you. It's day two of the Scottish Ghost Tour. Um, it's been a long way. We're near Stonehaven. The wind's howling. I'm getting more tired and more dishevelled, but we've just come across what I would say is the epitome of a Scottish castle perched on an outcrop in the sea, not far from the Grampians. This, well, I've never seen a castle like it. And of course, I've been down and had a word with the custodian. And guess what? <laughs> it's haunted. There's various ghosts here. Yet again, Mary, Queen of Scots, stayed here. So did her son, King James VI of Scotland and I of England. No reports of Mary haunting it, strangely enough. In 1685, there were in excess of 150 prisoners of conscience locked away in this castle in a dirty, dark dungeon known even to this day as the Whig's Vault. Quite a few of those prisoners died and I'm told that there's a rather nasty presence in the dungeons. The custodians don't like going down there on their own. And yet another green lady that's been seen, a green haze or mist, seen in various parts of the castle and in the tower. A ghostly dog, a large sort of deer hound, young dog, rather thin, seen by the custodian, Mr. McGregor. 
he went to tell some people to keep the dog under control and the dog just vanished. He's seen it on two or three occasions. A German tourist came to complain to him about the large dog that was wandering around and then suddenly disappeared. A young girl of about 13 years of age, dressed in sackcloth, has been seen wandering around. People, visitors, have come up to the custodians to tell them that there's a little girl wandering aimlessly about. It seemed as if she was looking for her parents. But then, like so many of these ghosts, she just disappeared. That's exactly what I'm going to do now. It's getting very late. The light seems to be going and this is not the sort of place that I'd like to linger around. Certainly not in the dark. Right, I'm in Inverness, um, capital of the Highlands. With me, Davy the Ghost. Um, you do, amongst other things, uh, ghost tours around Inverness. What else is it doing when you're dead? Well, <laughs> how long have you been dead? 174 years. That's quite a long time. And still haunting? Visiting. Well, that's what it's all about. So, come on, tell us all about it. What, what have you got? It, it's steeped in it, isn't it? I mean, the Highlands. Well, Inverness, the hub of the Highlands, the mysterious place, the Great Fault. Yeah. The most haunted town in Britain. In Britain? In Britain. Really? And I can say that quite safely, because we've got at least six or seven active ghosts at the moment, seen by many people. Here? In Inverness? In Inverness itself. Wow. Tell me, have you got... Well, one of what? the most haunted places in Inverness, telephone exchange. Really? They believe they've got a black lady. It's not a black lady. It's a black friar. Because that telephone exchange is actually built on the spot of the old friary. The friary was built in 1233. It was abandoned in the 16th century. Now, on the top floor of the new telephone exchange, when I say new, it's 50 years old. Right. But on the top floor, seen by many, many people, is what they think is an old woman just wandering along and she disappears. Yep. I'm perfectly sure that that is actually one of the old friars caught in the watchtower. Yes. And it, he's been seen by many, many yeah. people. Is he, what, what colour habit is he wearing? Black. Black. So probably Dominican or something like that? Well, Dominican, but black friars were of variations. Yeah. Amazing. Well, it's an interesting spot because if you go there at the back here, Inverness Council, being Inverness Council, put a plaque up to tell you that's where the grey friars were. Oh, they are. They black <laughs> That's a good one. So, now that, uh, this over here, a marvellous view uh, down the River Ness. Well, the River Ness, the Black Isle. And the name Black Isle is said to come from the witchcraft. Right. Now, Scotland had a shocking history of witchcraft. I know, you used to burn them as well, not hang them, didn't you? There was nothing beats a good barbecue. <laughs> and some of them were actually cooked on the Black Isle in the 17th century. Really? And that's where people believe the name comes from. Black Isle. Black magic. Of course. Yeah, yeah. And the Ness? I'll give you a story about the Ness. Yes, please. Behind me is the River Ness. Now, the River Ness is famous because that's the very first... I'll let you hold that. That's Thank you very much. That's the very first place yes. the Loch Ness monster was ever seen. In the river? In the river. In the year 563, St. Columba came to Scotland to bring Christianity. Columba was a warrior. he go about converting people. And if he didn't convert, he killed them. So most people decided to convert. And when he came to Inverness in 565, he came to River Ness. And he was just about to get in the water and swim to the other side when one of the locals came running out and said to him, Hey boy, you got that water and a dirty great beast will come up and eat you. Well, Columba was a brave man, so he sent another man in the water, and he told him to swim to the other side. <laughs> well, sure enough, as the man got halfway across the water, up rose this huge monster. Well, Columba ran forward, held up his crucifix, and he said, Go away, you nasty beast. And it did go away, <laughs> but it didn't go very far. It went four miles up the river to Loch Ness, and it's been there for the last 1,500 years, so it's due its pension shortly. However, the people in Inverness had a much better use for the River Ness because Scotland had the worst history in the whole of Europe for witchcraft and demonology. In fact, between 1479 and 1722, we burnt 17,000 witches. That's a lot of people. Now, in those days, if someone accused you of being a witch, you're a witch! You had to prove your innocence. Either way, you lost. 
Let him take you down to the river, and if it tied us firm to that toe, vice versa, pick you up and throw you right into the deepest part. And if you drowned, oops, sorry, <laughs> you're innocent, go home. However, if you floated, <laughs> you were guilty, and you'd be taken away and burnt. A very fair system. Now in those days, there wasn't any central heating, so the women wore lots of clothes and large skirts. Yep. And when they were thrown in the water, there's something created in the air pocket, and it would pop right back up. Well, the first thing that would happen there was, the husband would run forward with a large pole, and he would hold his wife under the water, till she drowned. The reason for that was simple. As I said, as she floated, she was guilty, and he be an associate to witchcraft, and he be burnt, and he wasn't going to have that, was he? Wow, now, didn't know that. Do you know what they actually did with the witches? Well, let me just give you an example of one family. In 1595, they brought the Balfour family from the Orkney Isles down here and they tortured them for the crimes of witchcraft. The youngest member of the family, the daughter, who was just seven years old, had the penny wings applied, the thumb screws. And the thumb screws were always based here, at the base of the nail, thus being the most sensitive part. And then they were tightened. And tightened. And tightened until the farm exploded. <coughs> the brother was placed to the boot. The boot was placed round the calf of the leg at such an angle when large wedges were driven in. The foot would crush. The blood would spurt out. Not enough blood. The very bone marrow itself. The mother was placed to the vice. With the vice, the hands were tied round the back at such an angle. When she was hoisted to the ceiling, the shoulders were dislocated. Then large weights were tied round her ankles. And she was left hanging like that for two days and two nights. The father was pressed to death. With pressing, you were tied very tight with a rack. A board was placed on the chest. And weights were added one at a time, so each rib would crack. Until the final weight was added. And the entire room cage would collapse inwardly. Pearson, the very body organs themselves. And this was only one family. Other than that, witchcraft, not a problem. So basically, David, that's one of the reasons that you've got so many ghosts. You've got so many tormented souls, basically. Well, yeah? I don't know if they're tormented souls. They could keep oh, me quite happy in their hauntings. Well, true. Um, now look, you do these throughout the year, I presume. Tours around... 365 days a year. Really? Ghosts don't get a day off. And how can they, if people want to come, because they will want to come on one of your ghost walks, I can assure you, when, when they've heard uh -huh. this. How can they get in touch? Well, tourist they can, information, they or? can phone me, they can go to the Tourist Information Centre, or they can phone me and book, or they can email me. Being a ghost, unfortunately, I've had to start haunting the net. Of course. Davey, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for telling me just a few of the stories that you feature on the walk yeah, I and i don't know whether i can grasp your hand being a ghost you can't or will i go right through you me. will it yeah all right well thanks ever so much i don't have any nightmares will you i won't <laughs>
old-fashioned pottery were also thrown at the houses. Two exorcisms were done here and the actual area where that poltergeist activity took place even now is actually chained off. Now I find it strange that there should be such poltergeist activity in a churchyard because although they appear to be spooky places and when you look at some of the emblems on the walls and on some of the gravestones you can understand why they are spooky but to be honest with you graveyards aren't usually the most haunted places it's said that the first person to be buried in a graveyard comes back as a ghost to protect all the other souls and spirits in that graveyard but again it's not usually poltergeist activity because poltergeists are usually energy forces using the mind of a living person the energy of a person usually children especially girls reaching puberty so why this graveyard should have been so haunted by the Mackenzie poltergeist no one really knows and this is the area where all the psychic energy the poltergeist activity tends to emanate from this was the old Covenanters prison and was the area where they were imprisoned actually here in this churchyard up on the wall here a coffin and behind it the tools of the sextant the man that dug the graves and inside here you can actually see the walls of the houses where the stones the bricks and the pottery was thrown against it and it's actually got gravestones and monuments on it it's locked as you can see I'm quite glad really because I don't really think I'd like to go in there it's not so bad in the daytime I certainly wouldn't like to do it at night but just before we leave this place there's an even more important story the story of Greyfriars Bobby a little shepherd dog so let's go and find his master's grave before we leave And while we're in Greyfriars Churchyard, a very haunting story. The story of Greyfriars Bobby, a little sheepdog, belonged to John Gray. He was a shepherd and he died in 1858. And for 14 years, that shepherd's little dog kept a vigil here by his gravestone until eventually in 1972, the broken-hearted little dog died and is buried, obviously not in the churchyard, but very close by. And uh, the last stop of the night, it's raining. Um, I've arrived at uh, Craith's Castle in Grampian, um, but I'm too late. It's locked. I can't get in. This castle is the absolute epitome of a fairy tale castle. Never seen anything like it. And it's haunted. It has the Green Lady Room. It was the family home of the Burnett family. And in the 18th century a girl believed to be either a daughter of the Burnett family or a girl in their care had an illegitimate child she was seeing one of the gillies the ghillie was immediately discharged from service and the girl and the baby disappeared some say that she went off to live with the ghillie in far-off lands Nobody ever knew 
But soon after she disappeared, a lady in green, yet another green lady, started to appear here at the castle. And she was often seen in the room known as the Green Lady Room, carrying a baby in her arms. 150 years ago, when they were doing some renovation in the castle, workmen pulled up a half in front of a fire and buried in a shallow grave was a young girl and with her a newborn baby and it looks as if the family had the girl and the baby murdered. Strangely enough the ghostly apparition stopped after the bodies were found and of course given a decent burial. She's seen occasionally but only to let people of the family know that there is an impending death in the family. My name is Richard Felix and I'm here at my base at the Old County Jail in the centre of Derby. This place over the last 150 years has been a place of terror, torment and of course death and that's one of the reasons why this place is as haunted as it is. I've chosen Derby as the catalyst for the national ghost tour of Great Britain. Over the last 10 years I have taken in excess of 95,000 people on a ghost tour somewhere around the Midlands and of course have spoken to many of those people on the tours and of course have realised just how fascinated people are by ghosts. This is the reason that we have chosen to do this tour. The video that you've just watched is a part of that series but I want your help. If you have a ghost story then please either email me or write to me at the address that you'll see at the end of this video. Of course you must remember that after speaking to so many people I think I have an ability to be able to see through some of the stories, to be able to differentiate between a story that is true or a story that's made up. And of course, you must remember that eight out of ten ghost stories can be explained, but it's the other two that you've got to worry about. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Do sleep well and don't have nightmares.